Good morning, um, or good afternoon, or good evening, if you're um, watching this at different times of the day. So welcome to the first um, DBT Skills um, by video. And um, please bear with me, because technology-wise, this has taken a bit of setting up. And um, this morning, I thought it had all sorts of, because as you can see behind me is the, the television screen. And so I had the PowerPoint on that. And um, as those of you know, if you have a mirror image, oh, it turns all the words the wrong way around. So therefore, I realized that I couldn't actually do that. So um, we're on plan B. So I'm hoping that this works. Um, so first of all, it's really important to say, although this is on the CWP YouTube um, channel, um, it's going to be restricted to only those people who've been sent the link. So I'd really appreciate it if you didn't um, share this. It's um, exclusively for um, the DBT Skills Group. OK, so this is Emotion Regulation 1 and the format's going to be just slightly different. OK. So first of all, um, done that introduction to DBT skills through video. Um, we're going to move on to do a mindfulness exercise, um, really teeny, teeny, tiny recap on homework. And um, then we're going to go into deliver the DBT skills training. Now, I'm afraid you have only got me this morning um, because um, two um, other members of staff have, are in um, self-isolation. Um, but we're hoping to have um, other presenters um, next week. Okay, so then I will, I'll just give you the um, homework task for this week and we'll have a, a wind down and a finish. Okay, so one of the first things I'd really like you to do is to um, just um, take your mind back to last week when we were talking about doing mind and being mind. And um, the exercise that we did was looking at what got in the way, what gets in the way of us being in either doing mind or being mind. And, and I think I'm very aware that I need to be in doing mind doing this this morning. Um, and it's possible that you need to be further along the edge towards being mind. Um, so what I would invite you to do is just to sort of have a mental image of that um, balance bar and look, think about where am I on this balance bar? What is going to help me pay attention to the information that's coming through to me? Because this, I think I'm, I'm anticipating this is going to take about an hour. I, it, it might be shorter, it might be longer because I've not really done it like this before. Um, that's quite a long time to hold your attention. So I suppose what I'm recommending is to sort of check in with yourself throughout this recording and think about how can I bring my attention, my focus back to what I'm hearing, the information that I'm, I'm hearing. So that might be a number of things. It might be um, I'm going to bring my attention back to the words on the slide. It might be because you know how we love a few pictures. It might be I'm going to um, look at the picture on the slide. It might be that I'm going to look at um, the person in the video, in this case me. So I might look at um, I might look at Angela's scarf. Um, there might be I don't know. I don't think you could see these on here. Um, but um, there might be I'll look at her earring. Or I, you know I move my hands a lot. So I might be I'll, I'll just look at her and see if she's moving her hands a bit. But whatever you're doing, the aim is to bring yourself your attention back. Now, one of the beauties of having this recording is that you can pause it and you can repeat it. So it might also be a good idea to pause at, at various points during this video. Just get up, just stretch, um, move around a bit and then come back and refocus. Um, the other thing I'd say is get yourself a piece of paper and pencil now. Um, I'm going to be um, asking you to pause and write things down um, throughout this presentation. Equally, um, because one of the disadvantages is, of course, you can't ask a question. Um, well, you can, but you're not going to get much back from your screen. Um, so 
if you ask a question, uh, if you're wanting to ask a question, jot it down on your piece of paper and then you can speak to your individual therapist about this um, because they're there to help you with any queries that you have. Um, and equally, what I would say as well is this is the first <laughs> this is the first time that we're doing this. And um, so on the one hand, I'm saying sort of bear with me. On the other hand, I'm saying, you know, actually, um, this feedback's really useful. So if there's something that um, I or anybody else are doing in these videos that is helpful, it'd be great to know about it. Equally, if there's things that don't quite work for you um, or you think maybe we could tweak this in some way, then that would be really useful to hear about. So um, between us, hopefully we are going to um, we're going to produce something that's going to be useful for it for us while you're um, uh, not able to attend the group. OK, so without further ado. First thing we're going to do is a mindfulness exercise and um, it's going to be slightly difficult, different um, to do the mindful exercise. Um, we're going to do a different one each week. This first one um, that we're going to do is looking at a, a body scan. One of um, the uh, most useful ways that you can learn about yourself and your emotions is by becoming more aware of your body, to becoming more aware of the sensations and the feelings in your body. And that takes time, it takes practice. Um, just sort of tuning in, saying, you know, being a bit curious about what's happening at the moment. If I was to scan myself from the top of my head to the tips of my toes, what might I notice? So this body scan is quite um, short. Um, I'm aiming for about three minutes. Um, there are longer ones on um, on the internet, um, so it depends. It depends what suits you best. Um, personally, I'm always best with short. Um, so, um, as always, what I would invite you to do is to pay attention to how you bring your mind back. Not so much about where your mind actually goes off to, because our minds just wander all over the place, don't they? Um, but what we're really aiming for here is how you're going to bring your brain back to where you actually want it to focus. And to be, have increase your awareness of what gets in the way of that. And that might be uninvited thoughts, it might be sensations, urges, associations, assumptions, judgments, attachments, rules, all of those things that come in uninvited when we did not say that we wanted those in our heads. And sometimes those make it harder and sometimes those make it easier for us to do the exercise that we're um, wanting to engage with. And sometimes those things create a pattern um, that are also present in our everyday life. So increasing our awareness around that helps us be more skillful in our everyday lives. OK. So I suppose my first question that I'd be curious about is when I said about doing a, a body scan, um, mindfulness, what your assumptions or associations were with with that and whether that makes it easier or harder for you to engage in this. I'm going to um, start the, the body scan. Uh, we have um, mislaid our meditation um, bowl sound. So um, I'm going to use something, something different to indicate the start and the finish. And um, I'm going to uh, read through this. So first of all, what I want you to do is I want you to get yourself as comfortable as you possibly can. OK, um, with with mindfulness meditation, what we're saying is, is, is you're practicing this as if you would in your everyday life. So we don't normally recommend um, lying down and with your eyes shut. Um, sometimes people find it easier when they're starting are off with body scans to close their eyes to sort of bring their attention inwards. Eventually, what we would be hoping you'd be doing would be, be doing this with your eyes open and, and a lot quicker. Okay. 
So, just so that you have an increased awareness of your body. So as I'm talking, um, your mind will obviously go off a wandering again. What I would invite you to do is to refocus by tuning in again on my voice. If you've got your eyes open, perhaps what you could do is you could tune into um, the scarf um, and just bring your mind back to the body part that we are asking you to focus on at that time. Okay. So, we will start. So the first thing that I want you to do is to just allow yourself to focus on your breath. And to pay attention to those breaths that you're taking in and the breaths that you're all letting out. And if it feels comfortable, just allow yourself just to take a deeper breath in and a longer breath out. And then what I want you to do is I want you to focus on your toes and your feet. I want you to notice how they feel against the surface that they're pressing on right now. Just be aware of whether they feel maybe heavy or light. Feel hot or cold, what their temperature is. Be curious about how they feel, what the sensation is. And then allow your attention to travel up to your legs. And the sensation of your legs resting against the surface. And as you allow yourself to focus on your legs, just be aware of how weighty they feel, whether there's any tension in your legs. Maybe you could be curious about the pressure of your legs on the surface. What I want you to do is just allow your attention to travel to your back as it leans against the chair or the floor or the bed, whatever it is that you're on at the moment. And just notice and be curious about the sensations in your back. What's the temperature there? Is it hot? Is it cold? What are the muscles like in your back? How might it feel if, if you allowed those, those muscles to soften slightly? You could be curious about it. And then what I want you to do is I want you to draw your attention to your stomach. And just be curious about how that's feeling right now in this moment. Notice how your stomach rises when you take a breath in and how it lowers when you take a breath out. And 
Notice the sensations in your stomach. And then allow yourself to just move to your chest. And pay attention to the level of tension or pressure in your chest. Notice if it's different when you take a deeper breath. What do you then become aware of? And then as you move to your shoulders, just notice how your shoulders sit on your body. Remember if there's any tension in your shoulders. How much weight does it feel that there are? There's another sensation there. If you were to allow your soldiers to soften as if they were to sort of sink into your body, what do you notice then? And then allow yourself to just move your attention to your neck. Be very aware of your neck supporting your head, resting on your shoulders. Can you soften your neck? And what we're going to do is we're going to move to your throat, your jaw, your face, facial muscles, and just in turn, just allow yourself to pay them some attention, to notice how they're feeling right in this moment. Does your jaw need to move? What is the sensation there? Can you allow your facial features to soften? And if you can, what does that feel like? And then what we're going to do is we're going to move to the top of your head. We're just going to allow your attention to move just slowly from the top of your head right down to the very tips of your toes and as you move slowly from the top of your head down to the tips of your toes it's going to notice your whole body and the sensations in your body You're going to notice your breathing how that affects how your body feels, the effect it has on your body. And you're just going to allow yourself a few deeper breaths. And then you're going to very gradually just allow yourself to become perhaps a bit more aware of the, the strength in my voice, that it's got a slightly different tone to it now. So what I'm doing is I'm inviting you to come back into the room. I'm inviting you to listen to my voice a bit more. I'm inviting you perhaps to change your body posture a bit, to maybe move into a more alert, attentive stance, focusing more on the external rather than the internal. So sometimes I do that by just moving myself upwards in my chair and finding something to focus on externally. 
And so how was that? What did you notice? What got in the way? If it was a thought or a sensation or an urge, when did you have that? How did it affect how you participated in the exercise? Just allow yourself just to pause the video for a moment. And then what you could do is you could just write some notes down to increase your awareness of, of what your brain does at times like this and how you can refocus your attention. Okay, so I am going to up the pace slightly because, as you know, this is our very, very tiny, tiny, tiny recap. Okay, so last week we looked at balancing doing mind and being mind. And I know that I need to get a bit more energy in my voice, I need to get back into doing mind. Um, and I need to move along um, that balance bar a bit. So I, I bring a bit more um, energy into the presentation. We also looked at walking the middle path, how we go from extreme to extreme and how actually we're most effective when we're sort of hovering somewhere around the, the balance bar in the middle. And we looked at how we can increase our effectiveness at moving along that bar. We also looked at your absolute favourite, loving kindness. Um, and um, I'm really curious as to how you got on with your homework. So have a think about, you know, how did you do with your homework? Did you um, follow the, the instructions that we gave? Did you use the worksheets? And, um, and what got in the way of you, you doing this, if anything did get in the way? So again, just allow yourself to pause and to write a few notes that you could talk about with your um, individual therapist. And without further ado, we are on into emotional regulation one. So I know that some of you have done this module before um, and so you may be some familiar with this. I suppose what I would say is um, whenever I have ever gone to any training, even if I've heard it before, there's always something new I pick up. And that's probably because we just don't pay attention to all of what is being told to us at any given time. So emotional regulation is the ability to control or influence which emotions you have, when you have them and how you experience and express them. It helps us become more skillful and more effective in our lives. And sometimes life happens and there may be very little we can do to alter the situation we're in. However, there's quite a lot we can do to manage our emotional reaction to it. And this is what we're going to focus on today and then over the next five weeks. Okay. So the goals of emotional regulation are to understand and name your own emotions. And um, this, this sounds, um, on paper, it sounds really easy, doesn't it? But actually, it's really quite difficult to do that sometimes. And um, particularly if we are feeling quite emotional at that time. So using a body scan regularly is one of the best ways of starting this process. Because what it does is, is it gets us in touch with what our body's doing. And our mind and our body are intrinsically linked. And because they're intrinsically linked, that means that what we're feeling usually starts somewhere in our body. And if we can become more attuned to what's happening in our body, uh, then we can get more familiar with the sensations that come up for us when we are in emotion mind. That also allows us more information about what it is we might be feeling because each emotion has its own unique signature. It has its own um, body sensations. It has its own urges that go with those body sensations. It usually has, well, it always has a purpose. Um, and um, it, understanding these and how we react and how, what, the, what we might be um, have the urges to do 
helps us regulate those emotions, but also helps us put a name to those emotions. And putting a name to emotion, being able to say, I notice I feel this way, can release a lot of tension. It can make us feel like somehow we're a bit clearer, where there's not as much confusion about what's happening at the moment. It's also really important to look at what emotions do for us. Emotions do a lot. Um, you know, we weren't born with emotions for no reason. They help us survive. So we're going to be having a little look at that um, a bit later. If you're able to do that and you're able to have more knowledge about your emotions, then it allows you to decrease the frequency of, emotion, of unwanted emotions in the first place. Um, so because you're increasing your awareness and we do a lot about sort of planning ahead as well in these modules, um, because you're increasing your awareness, actually, then you have far more control over what's happening to you. We also have a look at what makes us more vulnerable to emotion minds. OK, and um, having that awareness of when we're more vulnerable and being able to put things in place is really difficult, is really um, important in helping us cope with difficult things. It also increases our resilience, which is really hugely important. The goal of emotion regulation is to be able to decrease our emotional suffering. So painful emotions arise for us because we're human. What we don't want them to do is to overwhelm us. Um, what we want to do is we want to be able to remain as skillful and effective as we possibly can. So emotion regulation is um, an incredibly important area that um, getting to grips with this is really important. So it's possible that you might want to um, repeat, watch this video and um, also have the worksheets alongside you when we're doing this. So this week's topics. So what do emotions do for you and for me? and what makes it hard to regulate our emotions and also part of that is myths and we're going to have a wee little look at some myths as well okay so what emotions do for you this is really really important they motivate us um, so the reasons that we have different emotions, and we're going to come on to have a little look at some of those, the reasons that we have some of these emotions is because they help us survive. Everything that happens in our body is about survival. So, and because actually we are, um, as human beings, social animals, we are designed to, to work best in groups. So a lot of the emotions that we have um, are there because they help us stay within our group where we are safest. So you're sort of getting the impression now that everything really in our bodies and minds is geared towards our survival. OK, so for instance, and this great picture up here, um, if if um, a bear or other large furry animal was coming towards you at speed and you were with other people and you were the first person that had seen this standing there and going oh look at that do we need to do something maybe we need to run is not going to motivate us or anybody else to have um, an action is it um, so what we need to do is we, go, we need to go run now. Get out of there. Look what's happening. It alerts us. It makes so basically then we get this flight or fight. We get lots of energy surging through our bodies so that our bodies are geared up to do the things that, that we want them to do and keep us safe at this moment in time from the bear that's running down the road. OK, and um, Yes, another sign for me that exercise, you know, brings its dangers. So the other thing it does is it communicates um, to and influences others, whether we like that or not. So when you look at my face and how I'm talking and how you look at people's faces in your family, you are constantly getting tiny, tiny bits of information from this. And that communication between other people motivates them to um, act in certain ways. So, for instance, when we are upset, 
it motivates people to um, come and help us. When we are feeling angry, and certainly when we display anger, um, quite a lot of people, they move away quite quickly, don't they? So the other things that emotions do is they communicate to other people what is going on for us, and other people respond um, to us because of what we actually communicate, which is all well and good if we are communicating what we actually want to be communicating. And if we're communicating something different, we can obviously get sometimes get some really confusing interactions that we're not quite sure about what happened there. So being more familiar with what happens with your emotions is incredibly important because it gives you more control about what you are conveying to other people. And I think my absolute favourite around emotions is that they help us communicate with ourselves. They alert us to when things are not quite right, when things, when we're in an environment that doesn't feel good for us, when um, we are um, in a social situation that feels like it's not safe for us. By listening to our emotions, it gives us some really strong sense of what's right. It's a bit like when people say, you know, they walked in a room and something didn't feel right. Or it might be um, that they have a sensation about something when somebody suggests something. And it's sort of like, oh, I'm really not sure about this. And sometimes what we do is we dismiss those feelings, don't we? And particularly if there are red flags around sometimes people we meet, um, it's really um, tempting to just push that away, isn't it? To sort of get old, oh, you know, oh, well, I must be wrong. But actually, our feelings are telling us something and we need to examine them because sometimes feelings tell us things that aren't actually accurate. You know, mm -hmm. our emotions are not facts. So we need to spend some time working out what's going on emotionally and then pull in rational mind as well so that we are able to access wise mind and be as skillful as and effective as we possibly can okay so this is this is quite a lot of information on this slide isn't it okay so the best way of doing this is to have a look at your worksheets because all of this is is on your worksheets but um the other thing i'd really like you to do is i'd like you to have a look at some of the um the video clips that are the links that I've put on the next slide, um, which you would either do by putting in the search box um, of YouTube or you can. I will also um, text you the links to those. <clears throat> so I think fear, what emotions do for you? I think fear is um, one, of the, one of the ones that we can all recognize really quickly, isn't it? Fear has a very protective um, purpose it means it keeps us safe it keeps us physically safe and this is a really important um, aspect here um, it keeps us physically safe from danger now sometimes our brains get a bit confused they think it thinks it's keeping us physically safe when actually it's a psychological um, issue that we're, we're battling with so sometimes our minds can trick us into feeling fear and anxiety when actually there is no need to feel that. And we're going to come on in the future sessions to have a look at how do we get more familiar with our emotions and the purpose of our emotions so that we look at does what we're feeling right now fit the facts of the situation. When you have a look at the clips on the other side, um, there's a really good clip on disgust, which some of you will have seen before. And I think um, Christine gives a, a really excellent description of disgust and its function. And there's also a really good one on shame, which Marsha Lynham talks about. And Marsha Lynham, as you know, um, was a person who's instrumental in um, developing um, um, DBT. I would encourage you to look down your workshop at the other um, emotions down there and just have a look at um, what are the functions of our emotions they're all there for a reason none of these were invented as um, as superfluous they they, um, they all exist because they they have serve a purpose in some way so these are the um, YouTube clips that I talk talked about um, so the function of emotions here 
There's um, re they're all really, really short, um, two, two, three minutes tops. Um, so Marshall Einem talks about the function of emotions. So she is talking about some of the things that I've just talked here and how they protect us. Um, she also goes on to talk about the um, emotion of shame and how that functions as a way of keeping us in the group. And as we've sort of looked at before, being in a group is the safest place for us as human beings. We're not particularly strong. We don't function particularly well on our own. And here, Christine, um, she talks about disgust um, and gives some really entertaining, um, uh, really entertaining descriptions of disgust and looks at how you can change your body language, which is also something that we're going to come on in, in um, future sessions to look at, how you can change your body language to overcome some of your disgust if it's not warranted in that situation. So this slide looks at factors that make regulating emotions hard. Um, if it was easy to regulate emotions, um, I certainly wouldn't be sitting here doing this. And uh, Marshall Einem would, certainly wouldn't have um, invented um, DBT or developed DBT. So we're going to have a look at the, a few of these areas because this is really important because if you're struggling to regulate your emotions, sometimes we give ourselves a really hard time about this, don't we? We sort of, you know, we get frustrated with ourselves. We say, you know, why can't I do this? We um, berate other people for making us feel this way. Um, quite often we feel very, very frustrated. We're very critical to ourselves. And um, because actually some of the emotions that we feel are, are large and they feel quite overwhelming, particularly in that moment. And our overwhelming urge is to try and get these to stop because it feels really uncomfortable and we naturally move away from things that are uncomfortable. However, we have really positive emotions too. And um, if we, we try and dampen down um, the emotions that feel uncomfortable, we're also dampening down the other good stuff as well. So we need all of this. And as we've talked about before, we, we need it to function. So let's have a look at this. So biology, I think um, you're all really familiar now having you know, been in therapy for a, for a, a while that um, sometimes people um, are born slightly more sensitive to um, external and internal stimulus. Okay, and that includes our emotions. We are um, quite sensitive creatures and some people are more sensitive than others. And that comes with personality. It comes with who we are as, as people and that can have huge um, pluses. So if you are quite a sensitive soul, you might be quite someone who's quite passionate about things. So you might be um, somebody who desires change. You might be somebody who's instrumental in um, putting things in action that other people wouldn't do. You're quite a sensitive person. You're quite a caring person. You might be somebody who ultimately um, helps an awful lot of people. Um, all of these things are really, really good. Um, but actually, if they're coupled with um, finding it very, very difficult to regulate your emotions, that can make life quite hard for you. So that comes moves us on to um, biology coupled with lack of skill. So if we're quite sensitive people, um, but we don't really have the skills to manage some of those sensitivities, um, then that, that can cause us problems. Now, sometimes skills are, are taught um, when we're growing up. Sometimes they're absent and sometimes some things, some things we're taught um, about, some emotions we handle better than others. And there will be um, a pattern in um, anybody's family about what emotions are seen as, as more acceptable than others. So for instance, in some families, it might not be okay to show any fear, but it's okay to be really angry. Um, and in other families, that actually um, being sad is not okay. It's you, you have to be um, happy, you have to be upbeat most of the time. So um, some emotions that we feel we're taught to be quite skillful about and others, we haven't really got the skills to manage those particularly well. And in some cases, we sort of overlap one emotion 
with another and we're not quite sure how we did that or what's happening. Reinforcement of emotional behaviour, that's a really, really fascinating one. So I'm not entirely sure how this um, recording is going to do this, but um, I'm just going to... Uh, just going to try and move on to the next slide, so bear with me if this does not work. But basically, um, I really want to emphasise that um, emotional behaviour and how we react is not just about individuals it, and, our, and our families. It's about cultural aspects as well. Our emotional behaviour is influenced by how other people respond to us. OK, so, so for instance, if you are um, trying to convey something, something that is wrong. And um, so, for instance, my, my, the one that I tend to use quite a lot is a um, child who runs over and, and hurts their, their knee. OK, so they would they would run up to whoever was looking after them and they'd, they'd say, oh, you know, I've fallen over, I've hurt, I've hurt my knee. And um, somebody's going to react to that in a number of different ways. If somebody um, reacts to that by by sort of dismissing, so saying, no, you're not hurt at all, just get up and get on with it, and you know that your knee's hurting, you're going to want to communicate that in a more robust way, aren't you? So you might go, no, 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 it's really hurting. It is really, really hurting. And if it continues that you are being dismissed, that, that, that people are not paying attention to your knee, you are going to start screaming and you're going to start crying and you're going to start wailing because you know that your knee is, is really hurting. So then what happens is somebody might then respond to you. So what's happened is instead of somebody responding to you when you were a bit upset and saying my knee's hurting, when they responded to you is, is when you were really shouting, where you were really, really screaming. So what do you then learn from that? You learn that actually people listen to me more when I scream and shout. So all of this is how we as human beings get our needs met. And it's really important that we, we do get a lot our essential needs met. Another good example is if you learn when you're growing up that when you're really angry, people give you what you want, then you're not going to have much incentive to regulate your anger, are you? You're going to go through life knowing that if you square up to people and you're really um, aggressive, um, that's actually quite useful for you. So can you see how these interactions that we have with other people shape our and reinforce our emotional behaviour? So I'm going to move on to the next slide and then I'll move back. I'm hoping this will work. OK. I really love this slide. How to be British. So as you can see, man possibly in trouble, we're thinking, in the river, shouting loudly, help. Now, as we know, in Britain, an expression of, of emotion um, is usually frowned upon. It's, so if we weep and wail in this country, people are likely to move away from us and they are likely to send us to the doctor to get us assessed. In other countries, if you weep and wail, it brings assistance really, really quickly. So, but in Britain, this guy here is he's learning really, really quickly that actually what he needs to be is very, very polite and um, respectful in order to get the help that he needs. Here's another really, well, really good one that I really like. I'll allow you to read it through. It's a really good example, isn't it, of how it's not OK to be upbeat and pleased about yourself. Um, and because it's not OK to do that, then the the woman over here is um, modifying her behaviour. She's dampening down, isn't she? She's down regulating her joy. So let me go back. Oh, no, <laughs> it won't let me. So that experiment didn't go terribly well, well did it? <laughs> OK, 
So the next thing that we need to have a look at are myths. Hold on, let me turn this on. Okay, so I've just checked my notes, and actually there is another thing before maths. It talks about emo <laughs> talks about emotion. Um, so when we feel overwhelming emotion, when we are completely immersed in emotion mind, that makes it really, really hard to regulate our emotions. And you know yourself when that happens, don't you? It's like as soon as you are in that over um, emotional state, then everything you're thinking stops. You don't you see things in a very negative way. You might see things in a very fearful way. Um, but it clouds all your emotion equally when you feel that absolute love and joy um, that also clouds our thinking as well that that that, that phrase rose colored glasses was invented for a reason um, so when we are completely immersed in emotion mind when our emotions are really heightened and at their peak actually that makes it really hard to regulate them and sometimes that's appropriate you know, if you're in a situation like Marshall Lynham talks about tsunami, you know, if you if you're in a situation where you need to move quickly and an action is imperative, then um, you need to be mostly in emotion mind. You also need to have a bit of um, rational mind as well, but you do need to be mostly in emotion mind, and you would not want to be down regulating your emotions at that point. So, but having that awareness that when we are completely immersed in motion mind, that cannot be helpful is really very, very useful. Okay. So, myths. So, worksheet three, I think it is, has got a, um, a long list of, of myths about emotions and is one of the um, worksheets that we're going to have a look at with our homework. I want to talk a little bit about um, myths because um, myths develop for many, many reasons and they, they, they develop in the main because they help us make sense of things. They um, help explain what's going on, they help us, therefore they help us cope. And um, these um, can be socially and culturally linked um, and they can be widely held, but quite what makes them stand out is that they are they're not accurate. These are false, these are false, these these beliefs. And they are created with the information that we have available to us at that time. And that's really important because a lot of the myths that we create around emotion we create as children. So they might be based on information that's coming into us, and they might also be based on our own experiences. Um, but these myths, they, they get in the way an awful lot of us regulating our emotion. So, for example, when you think about how um, myths are created to help understanding um, with the information that is available at that moment, and you look at Greek mythology, you know, um, this, uh, this, this picture here is of Poseidon um, with his trident. And um, what the, um, Greek, the ancient Greeks believed was that earthquakes were caused because um, Poseidon um, uh, basically um, hit his trident on the earth. And that sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, and if you had no um, understanding about the, the earth and template, tem what they call templates, templates, anyway, those things that move when you get an earthquake. You have no understanding of that, but you sort of know that the Earth's moving and something must have caused that. Then it would sort of make sense that Poseidon, you know, bashed his trident on the on the floor. Equally, to explain why the sun moves over the sky or appears to move over the sky um, during the day, they were um, really convinced that this was because Helios was taking his chariot and he was um, moving across the skies. So it's a really good example, isn't it, for how it explains something that at that time does not make sense. In the same way that the Northern Lights um, were seen as souls of the dead, and this is um, because they were seen as souls of the dead, people did not want to go near them. So when the Northern Lights came up, everybody disappeared and wanted to avoid them. 
now you pay lots and lots of money to go and see them. Okay. Myths can also be used to dictate a, a moral guide to each generation. So you have a look, there's lots and lots of myths um, that help you modify your behaviour. Uh, Father Christmas being um, a really good one, um, that he only gives um, presents to children who are good. Uh, one I read, um, which was actually was when I was reading an Enid Blyton book when I was when I was little, um, was uh, that if you uh, make a face, like a, a not very nice face, and the wind changes, your face will stay like that. Okay, so. I experimented a lot with this and it turns out that it's not true. Um, but it sort of really made me think about um, making not very nice faces um, with my face when I was younger. So it modifies our behaviour, doesn't it? So myths about emotion developed over time, but they're also culturally based as well. So you think about the First World War, you know, it was all about, you know, do not talk about it. And that was the message that was put out um, a lot because people didn't understand what people were going through. People had no idea how to manage this. So they went with don't talk with it, don't talk about it. If you think of other cultural myths that emerge, boys don't cry. You know, that's something that's been around for a long time. And even though culture is changing now, you know, there's still a lot around, you know, men and emotion and it not being OK to show your emotion it makes you appear weak. Um, women um, socially come in for um, a lot of myths um, that they are more emotional than men, therefore don't think as clearly. Um, so you can see how all these myths are created through sometimes lack of understanding, sometimes the way um, society wants to modify um, behaviour um, and how they emerge through generations. And those generations are creating these myths based on the amount of information and uh, experience that they have at those times. So we also create our own myths as we're growing up based on the response we get when we are emotional. So if you're a little person and you get really angry about something and then coincidentally something bad happens, as children we do not see the bigger picture. We go with, I was angry, something bad happened, therefore if I get angry people get hurt. Obviously, that doesn't happen just the once, but, you know, repeatedly, if you're in a household where bad things are happening, then, you know, it's, it makes sense, doesn't it, that you would come up with these sort of conclusions. You might then come to the conclusion that I can't, I can't feel angry. If you're in an environment that is quite frightening, um, you may feel like you need to keep yourself um, tense and ready for anything, in which case you might develop a belief that I need fear to keep me safe. Equally, if you've been really upset and um, nobody's come to your aid when you've been really upset, you might develop a belief that actually if I start crying, I'll never stop. If being sad is not okay in your family, you might um, develop a belief that it's weak to show emotion. And if everybody in your family is having a lot of difficulty regulating their emotions, then you might draw the conclusion that actually emotions can't be controlled, they just happen and that's it. So, myths that emotions are bad or weak would then understandably lead to wanting to avoid those wasn't it and if you believe that um, extreme emotions are just that and that is who you are as a person then you, your motivation to try and regulate those is going to be low isn't it so what's really important about this is that um, we understand that the myths that were created around emotions were created for some good reasons. They made sense at the time. They certainly made sense with our, the limited experience and knowledge that we had at that time. 
However, it doesn't make them true. And they, those myths create a barrier to us um, regulating our emotions or really examining those emotions. Because if we're avoiding a lot of things, we're missing out on a lot of information and it's also affecting our behavior as well, which quite often can be really unhelpful. So. You will see on worksheet three, um, that um, there is a long, 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 long list about myths. And there is also a challenge under there. And then under there, there is also the short challenge that you have to yourself about this. Um, so I would encourage you to pause at this point and just have a look at that worksheet because that's going to also be on your homework list. Really want to pick up on the first one though. There is a right way to feel in every situation. And that just doesn't make any sense, does it? Because every situation is unique. And every person in that situation is seeing that situation from their own unique perspective. And people are very, very different. So that means that um, personalities um, affect how we feel in situations. I, for instance, will never ever be somebody who um, feels comfortable going on a roller coaster. Nor do I ever want to go for a bungee jump. So I know that in those sort of situations, I would feel really scared. For somebody else, they might be brimming and overflowing with excitement. There are lots of different situations that we react to differently because of who we are. And those are our emotions. We have the right to feel what we feel. Those emotions are telling us something important about what feels right for us personally. So I'm going to let you go through the rest, through the workshop. The sheet and if you have questions please make notes of these and then write them down so that you can um, talk them over with your individual therapist okay. so homework yay so what we would like you to do this week is we want to have a look at what my emotions are doing for me which is worksheets 2 and 2a and we also want to have a look at myths about emotions, which is worksheet three, which is the one I've just spoken about. And if you haven't already, just go back and have a look at those video clips um, talking about emotions, because next week what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, individual emotions in a bit more depth. We're going to have a look at their unique signatures um, so we can become a bit more familiar with them. Okay, so at this point, what we do is we normally go around the group, and as I'm sitting here now, you can probably see I'm in the skills room, and I imagine you all sitting here um, and um, going around to say one word to sum up the morning. Maybe what you could do is sort of go with one word to sum up um, right at this moment how, how what's happening for you. You may prefer to just write down something that makes you smile. Um, so I know there's been quite a few things that have gone around in the group, so it might just be allowing yourself a few moments to think of the times when there's been laughter in the group. It might be nice to sit and think about things that people have said in the group um, that has made you smile or has felt like it has had meaning for you. I am now going to sign off. And um, I am going to get this video to you somehow. Um, and um, I will see you next week when I'm hoping to have um, uh, somebody else with me. Um, so um, you don't get just bored with the sound of my voice coming over it all the time. OK, so. Let us know. Give us some feedback on this. Let us know how it went. OK, and um, take good care of yourself.